Okay. Uh, we had a little bit about uh, the presentations and reports. Last week, we ended on a crescendo. Uh, so the idea is that you would have some projects to fill in yourself in the know uh, and also watch some videos. I wanted to then start today with the review of the projects that I wanted you to um, to go through and to get a sense for uh, how many of these concepts uh, stuck with you. So there will be a set of Mentimeter probes now. Uh, and then we're going to review parts of the collab projects as a function of what I get back from you now. Then we're going to continue uh, a little bit on the deep networks angle um, and to try to elaborate on those videos that I was expecting you would be watching from three blue, one brown. And I'm going to also probe uh, how many of them you've actually have watched. My interest here when I'm presenting feed forward neural networks is primarily to relate the uh, certain predictions from feed forward neural networks to how brains actually work. So remember in the spirit of this course, we are trying to, re, uh, to bring cognition and machine learning together rather than just presenting machine learning as an independent field, which it actually is. Uh, so we want to maximize the synergy between the machine learning presumptions and what, the, uh, what our uh, goals with biological neural network understanding are. And so I'm going to be talking a little bit about uh, certain aspects of convolutions, transformations, and, mach uh, and machine learning, such as the, the, um, the curse of dimensionality, uh, some of the ideas of manifold uh, parameter space uh, and things like that, also convolutions that we didn't have the time to cover last time. The feed forward to so do it yourself receptive field project, so essentially a manually tuned feed forward neural network should then give you sufficient information for this uh, to start in the same page as. Uh, as today's slides. Second half of the lecture, we're going to try to cover a wide space from recurrent neural networks, or a little bit of unsupervised learning evolution and reinforcement learning. I don't know how much of this we're actually gonna be able to fit here. Um, then if we're not gonna, if we're not able to uh, cover it all, Either take uh, take the uh, the minor, which extends these uh, topics into a much longer uh, uh, much long, longer interval, or uh, indeed ask me, <laughs> because uh, it's a short course. Now, and yeah, so deep learning reinforcement learning, and so I'll try to get to that. But uh, admittedly, it's also a tall order. In fact. This time, I, uh, I feel like the material is rather compressed. But hopefully, it is. Uh, you already have like the legs up from what you had so far. Let me see if there are questions. So this is the introduction to today, and without further ado, so basically, you know, we're going to be focusing today on these highly abstract single neuron uh, networks and structures. If you remember. Uh, you've seen it before in three blue, uh, three blue, one brown uh, in these one hour lectures, but ultimately we're talking about these abstracted single unit artificial neurons that have transfer functions that smoothen out the output space. So that's basically what today is about. And we're going to be com uh, combining them in a vast variety of different shapes and, and structures to see what kinds of funny things that they can do. Um, and we continue via here, this Mentimeter screen. So is this the, is this the, yeah. So actually, let me just make sure that we're in the right. Uh, ah, yes. So, so here we start by seeing how many, uh, how much of the projects you've actually done 
uh, so just simply whether you want from the back to the bottom of all of these four projects because they will uh, help me understand how much you've done offline and at what level uh, we should talk about them. Then I'm going to have a couple of questions about receptive field and so forth. But uh, I hope you can see this. And if you can, uh, also you're welcome to raise your hand if you have to or, or, or add uh, things in the chat. Um, and please go to menti.com and use the code 286225 to tell me your level of completion of the different projects. So you had a connectivity project in which you created adjacency matrices in Collab um, to understand how networks are symbolized by a, a matrices. I know that some of you that did computational science before you've, uh, you've encountered uh, adjacency and connectivity matrices just to get a sense for how much you already understand this. And then we had the final project from last time, uh, which was the do-it-yourself receptive field, which is uh, to understand how weight, uh, weights of networks, can you, can you actually vote this? Because no one is actually moving. Um, oh, things are happening. Okay, so do-it-yourself receptive fields then is to try to uh, relate weight matrices and weight vectors and basically the linear weighting of inputs on a network or uh, to how its receptive fields would look like. So basically what are the favorite patterns of a network? Uh, creating them because uh, there's no better way to understand how backpropagation, for example, works when you're training uh, stimulus than to actually tune it yourself by hand because then you see, ah, what it means to be optimal in this case is this and that. Uh, so you're all very close to the finish line. The TensorFlow playground is a little bit of a, of a loser. And I, and I think I understand why, because you actually haven't been uh, introduced to it as deeply as uh, should have. In fact, I'm going to do it today. Probably one of the first things we're going to do. And then the simple neural network was rigged to uh, to give you a sense of what are the transfer functions, what's the role that they play, especially also in recurrent neural networks that have their own activity and that activity is constantly being pumped into itself um, recursively. And so the simple neural network the purpose was to give you a sense of when do you get spontaneous activity in a network and why do you have to bound the weights via transfer functions? How do we actually do that? So the DIY receptive field with only 10 responders, please everybody respond now, okay? So if we have 18 participants in the lecture, then I actually would very much appreciate if everybody responded to this, even if you know, you're one of my students and uh, you haven't done it, uh, please, <laughs> please mark it uh, as if you had done it and you already understand. <laughs> okay, and we're gonna be playing a little bit with the TensorFlow playground and the kinds of questions that, uh, that are, were in the quiz. If you already answered, answered these questions and you have some lingering doubt about the projects, this is a great time to, uh, to also ask a question. Yeah, the distribution on the DIY receptive field is a bit on the uh, on the low side, I see. So there's quite a, quite a couple of responders uh, that, you know, barely started. Now, luckily, um, you know, some of you actually got a sense of what you were trying to do, or probably just looked in and said, ah, well, I, I, I kind of figured this out, I understand. So you've, uh, I hope that that's what the tools represent. Um, but we're going to be talking a little bit more about uh, about the uh, structures and networks in, in the future. Have 13 responders. 
maybe some others are taking coffee. I'm going to take this as a representation of the whole class, which it isn't. Okay, yes, 14 responders. So we're, we're doing well. Uh, TensorFlow is the obvious loser. So that's what we're going to be focusing on now. And I expect that the things that I mentioned about these, uh, the receptive fields and the purposes and learning goals of these other projects became clear. I move on to the next query uh, in Mentimeter, which is, what is the, now this is a funny thing. How do I, uh, I think I have to, actually I have to open two Mentimeter, uh, two Mentimeter windows, one for presenting and the other one for, Now, these are actual questions that I wanted to, um, for you to evaluate. So the question here is, a neuron has a receptive field when, uh, and so there are a couple of possible answers. So these are basically trues or falses, zeros or ones. You should, uh, you should think about them like, uh, and I want to see if, so multiple alternatives can be correct. Uh, so uh, think about that. So I want to see, you know, your grasp of the of the concept. And uh, I figured that trues or falses can help you. I guess that uh, this is indubitably uh, your preferred answer um, and everything else is wrong. Uh, yes, uh, you're right about that. And, but I wanted to bring up something here. When we talk about the neuron having a receptive field, usually we are creating a paradigm of stimulus presentation to the neuron. And obviously we cannot present all the possible stimuli uh, to a person when they have, or a person or a cat or mouse, when they have an, el an electrode recording one of those neurons. And so in fact, a receptive field is kind of like a subjective question. I already mentioned this before, but it's important to have the idea that what we're trying, we're starting from the presumption that those are the kinds of things that the neuron can respond to. And it has to respond specifically, at least to a few of those stimulus. That's the only way in which you will have a receptive field for it. And it's not necessarily visual. I mean, the, the second uh, question there, is it an area of the visual cortex? Obviously it's not an area of visual cortex. It's an, if it is a visual receptive field, it's an area of the retina, for example, or an uh, area of the world. So it has a receptive field for X. And that's, uh, and that's the answer. Great. Uh, so receptive fields are clear then. Then, here, tuning curves. Um, would you kindly then do this one? Can you still vote or is it, is it a difficult set of questions or is Mentimeter taking time to update? All of these things are possible. 
This looks like it's going to be a little bit more interesting. So I put this as a, as a graded response. In fact, it should also have been zeros or ones, but it's okay. I mean, we're going to find out uh, what you actually mean. Um, so, and, and some of these answers are actually graded. could think about these statements as believability of these uh, particular assert assertions. Let's go up to 14 and then I'll discuss it. Elevens are big amongst us. Okay, let me start to discuss it with 11 uh, responses. I feel uh, hopefully this is a representative sample. Now, a tuning curve measures the response of a neuron to a certain stimulus dimension, right? So I haven't actually written the entire line there. It does measure the response of a neuron, but it's not simply a firing rate, of course. It's a firing rate as a function of something else that you vary continuously, right? So it is also a, a relative, a, a, to make sense, it needs to have some sort of continuous support. So your X axis has to be some sort of variable that you select to have uh, a continuous representation. For instance, if you're making a tuning curve for, um, for Jennifer Aniston, you have to have on the x-axis some sort of morphed version of Jennifer Aniston's face <laughs> so that you can relate then the input to frequency in a continuous fashion. So for, for some of you that said that tuning curve is not continuous, I would be very curious whether this, what I just told you made sense. And if it didn't, I would like to hear from you why you answered that it is not a continuous function. Uh, a tuning curve is a continuous function. It, 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 the, re, the way that it will make sense uh, to represent uh, a stimulus space, so this one dimensional x axis, is by being continuous uh, across certain space that has been assumed. Now, something else here uh, that didn't make a so it said it's a continuous function. And before I go to the next one, I want to discuss these two other properties of the, uh, that may appear in a tuning curve. So it can very well be a Gaussian function. Sometimes it is a beautiful Gaussian function, as you've seen with the cricket's hair and with the, uh, with the receptive fields for orientation. Those are lovely and easy one dimensional, if you like, uh, X axis or stimulus dimensions to look into. And it just so happens that if you're in the right place of the brain, uh, you will have a Gaussian like response to those stimuli. But if you're not in the right place of the brain, it might very well be that it's not uh, Gaussian. It can be any function, really. I mean, it's since you're measuring the activity of the neuron uh, upon repeated presentations of a stimulus, it might very well be that it's not even unimodal that it doesn't have a single peak. It might have actually two peaks. And if you choose the, that basic dimension, like the orientation, uh, and say, for instance, that you want to know what's the neuron's direction. 
If you have the nearest direction, you have 360 degrees of possible dimensions that you can have. Now, if you, uh, if you present directions to this neuron and it actually is a more um, of an orientation neuron that has only 180 degrees and it comes back to 180, that neuron tuning curve for direction will be bimodal. It, and you know, even if you could find a space, a stimulus space to make it unimodal. So it, uh, it's generally not a Gaussian, it's generally not unimodal. It's only when we publish papers that they become Gaussians and unimodals because those look very pretty and we understand because you, know, like if you vary that dimension, you lose it. It is definitely a single neuron property. Although you can measure the populations, you know, the tuning curves of a population, the question here is, what is the tuning curve of this neuron? You're recording a single neuron and you can only talk about the tuning curve of a single neuron. So basically that's the favor, the way that the neuron responds, a single neuron responds to a class of stimuli. So it is a single neuron property effectively. Uh, also, if that's not clear to some of you that, uh, that responded here, you know, strongly disagree that it's a single neuron property, surely multiple neurons can have tuning curves, but a tuning curve is a property of a single neuron. And uh, yes, it can be multidimensional. In fact, <laughs> generally it is incredibly multidimensional. The uh, recent nature papers looking into joint encoding of color and orientation have discovered that not only can they be uh, multidimensional, they're best represented by multiple dimensions. It's not like you have one neuron for a single orientation and one neuron for color. You actually have neurons that jointly encode orientation and color. So you basically have a 45 degree yellow. Imagine that. So it's more likely that you have a neuron that encodes for these two contingencies than uh, separate neurons that encode exclusively for yellow or exclusive orientation which makes sense in the context of a population encoding that we've mentioned last lecture as we were discussing Nango and the uh, an encoding of say a two-dimensional stimulus. You spread the two-dimensional stimulus into many neurons, they will jointly encode that two-dimensional stimulus. There will be. So good question, let's see. Isn't it then that this multidimensional tuning curve is not a single neuron property? No, it's still a single neuron property. It's multiple dimensions that that neuron is responsive to. It's a surface, probably if it's two dimensions uh, and or a manifold, it is three, four dimensions. So it's still gonna be, what does that neuron do to the combinations of those dimensions, right? So uh, you actually have the problem here uh, of, uh, of uh, dimensionality curses. So the curse of dimensionality here would say, say for instance, you want to measure the, the multidimensional tuning curve of a given neuron in your brain. Now you have to present to make, to, to, to sample that tuning curve or that, that tuning surface, you have to sample in every single combination of the input spaces. So for all of the orientations, for all of the colors, you have to present one of each for the neuron to see how jointly encodes them. If you present it only one at a time, you can still draw the tuning curve and might still even look Gaussian, might still even be unimodal, but you would be missing the fact that it's actually a surface that it's representing or a multidimensional surface. Aha! Aha is good. So I like aha. So thank you, Niels, for the question. It's a good question. And, uh, and this is precisely why this slide is here. Um, and yeah, I mean, everybody knows that uh, tuning curve relates input to finding frequency, to frequency of the neuron. Now, this is related to the uh, minimal neural network example. Uh, in the collab. And uh, this is something I, I definitely need to discuss a bit because we didn't go into detail of transfer functions uh, yet. Uh, and uh, I am presuming that they will become, they will, they're fairly intuitive to most of you. Uh, 
and uh, I wanted to gauge that my intuition that you all kind of understand it and so I don't have to belabor it by asking these obvious questions. So would you kindly, uh, so I hope that you can see, 286225. We have some lounge music, right? As you as you're selecting these things, I think I'm going to introduce some lounge music in the future lectures. Okay, eleven. Eleven is good. We uh, didn't make fourteen this time, so yes, it maps input to output. Uh, <laughs> Uh, you're absolutely right. It does map input to output, and that's what it does. It could be linear, right? I mean, okay, and for, in fact, if you just have a transfer function that multiplies it by one, uh, it maps the input space from inf minus infinity to plus infinity to the output space of minus infinity to plus infinity. It represents the activity of a single biological neuron. So the emphasis here uh, in this question was the word biological. Uh, so how does it represent activity of a single biological neuron? As a matter of choice. In general, it represent, uh, so the transfer functions, since they're not talking about spikes, they're talking about the abstraction of firing rates as spikes. Uh, they might represent the average rate of single neurons, but they're more often thought of as representing the activity of populations of neurons. Uh, because the idea being in a large population of neurons, all of them with all or non spikes, their joint firing rate is actually encoding a continuous variable. You will find that metaphor in very many places. And in fact, when I've, uh, I don't know if I've advertised this book before. Uh, so this is Elias Metz, uh, the, the father of Nango, How to Build a Brain. So this kind of book and this kind of approach basically very does that um, assumption. It, it justifies it, it discusses it, but it does that, that assumption almost without consequences. Yes. That's what it's happening there. You have spiking neurons, but ultimately what you're encoding are continuous variables. And so your transfer function is a good representation for a spiking neuron in certain cases, because it's simply me measuring the activity of population of neurons. If you're measuring, measuring say for example, EEG, you could uh, search for the tuning curve. It will be very messy though, on, on electroencephalography by just putting a, uh, an electrode in, in the cranium. Uh, and in fact, that's how brain computer interfaces often work. You just think about left and right and your, uh, your a pedal moves to the, from the left to the right or something. So it has the tuning curve, but uh, representing more uh, the activity of a population of neurons. But it also represents a tuning curve of a single neuron. Uh, and in fact, a, a transfer function is often uh, in certain networks, it, it will represent the uh, a tuning curve of a population of neurons. But this is all representational level. This is all what the scientist chooses that he believes that that tuning curve stands for. Both single ne biological neuron and representing activity of population of neurons are essentially correct if you know how to argue them, but you have to be able to make your assumptions clear. That's why this yes or no question false 
or true is a false dichotomy, as many of these are. Uh, and so here, we keeps inputs bounded. Well, surely in, it doesn't keep the input bounded because the whole idea is that you're taking a, a huge space of possible inputs and you're constraining it or transforming it into an output. But by definition, the input can be anything, right? So it does not keep the uh, output bounded, uh, you are right. Uh, and it keeps the output bounded most likely, but not necessarily if you have a linear transfer function, uh, it does, necessar does not necessarily, or it does not effectively keep the output bounded. The rectified linear unit is a piecewise continuous response that responds with a zero up to a value, and then with a linear response from a certain value on, if the output is not bounded. The input is bounded by the minimum possible value, zero. Uh, so a sigmoid definitely bounds the input both for my minimum and maximum value. And, but it's not correct that they must have a minimum and a maximum value. It depends on the level of representation, depends on what you're happy with. There are reasons for the rectified linear unit not having a maximum. And these are more involuted reasons that are best discussed in the context of machine learning and coding capabilities. General idea being the rectified linear unit has a well-formed derivative at any point when it's actually firing. And it's a continuous function. It doesn't have to be a continuous function. It can be a, a function broken in the middle like the rectified linear unit, for example. But it's often very, you know, mostly continuous, almost all continuous. In fact, if I had had it my way, this uh, last question in the slide would probably have a nice little peek towards correct. Uh, you chose to put it at 50-50% and it's also okay, but the idea is that it's mostly continuous. You would like it to be continuous, but a threshold function as a heavy side function is not continuous. It's a big discontinuity right in the middle, right? Um, okay, Roger asks, uh, isn't the input of one neuron the output of another if you have multiple layers? I guess that the, con the question comes in the context of uh, keeping input bounded. Is that, is that what you mean, Roger? Uh, so yes, well, I mean, it, by bounding the output, the lovely property is that you basically uh, create the, the whole network now becomes bounded, if, especially if it is connected recursively. But for the, from the perspective of the single neuron, the input is not bounded. It could, could come from the outside and, and go to plus infinity. Obviously, these things don't make sense biologically, but that's not the point, right? So the point is that there is a linear range or some range in which the responses are uh, being constrained to. Thank you for the question. It's good. So the input of one neuron is the output of another. And so if you constrain the outputs, you're also constraining the inputs. However, the weights that you're multiplying it, by, it with have to be constrained too for that to be true. If you have um, some sort of learning paradigm that continuously increases weights, say, towards infinity, uh, the input becomes unbounded again. Surely this is a little bit of a contrived experiment, but the uh, but even gradient descent can sometimes uh, create weights that grow without bound. Uh, most clearly in associative learning, when you have something like the Hebbian rule, we haven't talked about the Hebbian rule. I hope to make time for it today. Uh, I think that there will be time in the context of recurring neural networks. The idea is that you have an associative plasticity rule when two neurons are co-active uh, and they inform a third neuron, then the connections between the third neuron and the, and the feeding neurons are reinforced. So if you then have that contingency coming over and over again, the, uh, the weights grow without bound, but you can still keep the network bounded by, uh, with, a, with a specific transfer function. Cool. 
And now for the last question of the day. Three, you know, three blue, one brown has become, I think, one of the greatest YouTubers uh, out there. I mean, like, if you ask me, like, you know, who's your favorite YouTuber, I, I don't, I don't blink. I think that this is, uh, uh, it's, it's one of the geniuses out there, and he is a pedagogical genius. The way that he puts things up uh, are uh, concise, poignant, mathematical, clean, but at the same time intuitive, lovely. So I hope you enjoy it as much as I do. Uh, and it's sometimes just best to defer it to people that are doing this for a living. Uh, I would actually love to, to do it myself too, one, maybe one day uh, when I don't need to write grants anymore. Uh, <laughs> uh, but uh, I think that he has done a phenomenal job uh, of, at the level that I think is relevant for Primer particularly to put these videos together. And this is then why I, irrespectively of you having watched it up to now or not, something that it, it's a reference is a, a set of, uh, of things that uh, you might develop, benefit from in the future respectively ah, okay so he talks very swiftly about the xor problem the xor problem is actually also only very swiftly touched upon in our project um, by uh, in our make your own receptive field project. I'm going to, I'm going to chat a little bit about that. So this is lovely. So this is perfect. Uh, I didn't have to talk, uh, tell you about back propagation. I didn't have to tell you about the gradient descent. You understood everything. So this is exactly what uh, what my goal was with it. So uh, fantastic blended learning there experience. Uh, the XOR still needs to be um, still needs to be covered. But uh, otherwise, I see that you've uh, you've benefited from it. Trying to get my iPad here in the right orientation. Great. So thank you for your contributions. Uh, Ten people have uh, answered, so not uh, not all of you, but you've think that the, the bare essentials are there. And with those, the rest of today's lecture is going to be probably the very straightforward for you to follow. And I'm not going to belabor very much the feedforward neural network concepts. I'm just going to create a, a, a line, uh, hopefully, that is going to finish our story arc. And yeah, trying to tie, tie a couple of these things. And that is then the plan. Let me go quickly here. So I think that the XOR problem is uh, very straightforward to follow. Let me share with you the um this screen here so say you have two inputs neurons to an output neuron and you want to find weights w1 and w2 that will produce uh, so say this is a threshold neuron, so it's have, it sums the and has a heavy side function on the other end. So this is how we represent it. So the heavy side function, if you remember, just if I take it out of here, uh, we were talking about bounded, not bounded inputs. So in principle, uh, so up until a certain threshold value, it responds with a zero and with from the threshold on the response with a one. Okay, so say you have this lovely neuron here, and it has a heavy side function. And you want it to, this feed forward neural network here, you would want it to produce the logical operation of X or. Uh, I very quickly talked about and operations, uh, and I think that the, the, you've probably seen this before, where we checked for propositional lo logic, many of you have had already before, if I remember correctly. And 
so if you have an AND function and you have then propositions A and B for the, the result of that proposition, so the result is specified as when A and B are both true, uh, then we produce Chopin. When A and B are both true, A and B, then result is true. If only one of them is true, there, there's no and. And if none of them is true, then there's also no and. So there's only and when both are true. And this is very easy then to create. So say, for instance, now you want to find weights, W1 and W2, that will respond to an and function is relatively straightforward. If you then construct um, the inputs here uh, for neuron A and neuron B, and these are values, firing rates, you're basically saying that you want to create a separating hyperplane that is going to say yes to this guy and no to all of these other guys here. So any hyperplane here will separate these. Lovely, right? Now for XOR, oh, actually, let me see if I have a nice red here. Let's see if this is a nice red. Uh, so this was end and this was easy and I'm going to throw it away. Now, say we want to do an XOR function, and uh, the XOR function is an exclusive OR. A normal OR uh, is simply something that says that if either of the conditions A or B obtain, the answer is true. So if there is A and B, OR says, yeah, either A or B uh, can be, so if you have both you say true. If you have only one of them being true, it's true as well. And if you have none of them being true, it's false. So this is the inclusive or because it includes the possibility that both A and, uh, and color is really hard to read. Or maybe, uh, apologies then, let's uh, get some different, uh, try one more time with the red because you're not colorblind, are you? Um, Right. Or and so for this problem, you want to find also something that includes these three data points, but excludes this guy. Also easy. I mean, you can find any of these uh, separating hyperplanes. So you can find W1 and WB that will express this line and you will have a separating hyperplane. Uh, you press it onto the heavy side and you're able to, to find, you know, W1, W2 combination that will express this function. But non-linearly separable problems cannot be solved by a single layer feed forward neural networks. And so, if you have an XOR, you have an exclusive OR. It doesn't want AND. So basically is when A and B are both one, the result should be zero. It should only say one when either OR are the case. And the problem is clear. If you look into the data that we're trying to separate, so trying to now find this uh, plane W uh, that will do this. And that's not possible because say now I get the, these combinations here as ones and these as zeros. So it should be answering one here. This should be true and this should be false. Now that's the XOR problem. You cannot create a single line that will 
include the ones and exclude the zeros. You really have to sort of create uh, create a, a, a convex part of this space. You have to really try to find some way to select this. We're going to talk about that in a moment, but this is the XOR problem. And this is what you cannot do with uh, feed forward neural networks. And you should try to convince yourself that it's not possible. Maybe some of you already heard about this problem and you already know how to solve it uh, with if you add another neuron. And uh, if you haven't thought about that before, it's a nice exercise, simple exercise to think about, you know, what would be a structure of a network that allows you to do when this guy here, yeah, so basically that allows you to do the XOR. Cool. Uh, you say that A equals zero and B equals zero gives one, but I think that should be zero. Uh, in which case, let's see. Oh, you're right. Uh, so, uh, so I actually, <laughs> if you'll notice here, uh, Vika, um, <laughs> as I was writing, I made that uh, so, faux pas. So I had written zero originally in the, in the red you could not see. And, uh, <laughs> and when I change the color, I wrote one. Uh, anyway, so uh, this is how the brain works. And this is how the XOR problem uh, is stated. In the 70s, when uh, people were discussing, yeah, let me, let me talk to you a bit like this. So in the 70s, when people were discussing the possible, you know, how much uh, neurons could actually accomplish. The proof, effectively, by Marvin Minsky and Seymour, Seymour Poppert uh, on the, the impossibility of creating feed forward neural networks that learn the XOR problem was crippling to neural networks and connectionism as a whole. So people wanted to then throw the baby with the bathwater, says it cannot do XOR, it cannot do nothing. There were already solutions, and even Minsky and Popper already knew that with more, with more layers you could solve it. But this straw man that created from this proof basically uh, nullified uh, the advances of connectionism and neural networks in the eyes of the, popul of the general population. There was still a niche set of people that were working on this, but the the field of good old fashioned artificial intelligence who was dealing with propositional logic and programming languages like Prolog and Lisp, they've, they've gave up. Uh, they've said like, no, connection is cannot, it cannot be it. I mean, if we're only doing here uh, fuzzy logics and something that is actually inference, uh, active propositional inference, that was the dominating idea until the revival of, uh, of deep learning. Um, okay, so this is, um, so this was the review until now, so it's 10 o'clock, we talk, talked about uh, for an hour now, and let's pause it for a moment, let's give it uh, ourselves 10 minutes, uh, if you don't mind, so for uh, at 10.10 10, we come back and we're going to talk about feed forward neuro deep, uh, deep neural networks, we're going to come back to the XOR problem, uh, and then talk about curse of dimensionality and a certain other aspects. Okay? At 10 out of 10, we see each other again, it's basically in eight minutes. Hurry with your physiology. <laughs>